please bow with me as we pray. Our gracious and loving and awesome Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day of life, for another time to come and study your word and learn more what you would have us to do. To We pray that uh, all what we will hear and, and uh, do today will be pleasing in your sight. We pray that uh, Nick will have a ready recollection of what he wants to say and that he will do it with a boldness and that we will have open hearts and hear what he has to say and examine ourselves and take it to our uh, neighborhoods and the others so that we might bring lost souls to thee. Father, we may have, uh, we have a lot of names on our uh, sick list. We pray, Father, that you will be with each one as their needs are. We pray that you would be with them as only you can. Father, we especially pray for Phil Wilkins. Uh, and we pray for Bobby and Ann Pittman, Bob Tankersley, uh, my father Leon Best, who's in the hospital. And Father, there's there's many more names on the list. We pray that you will be with them and that we will look for opportunities to help wherever we can. Father, we just thank you for everything that you do for us. We pray that you will be with us as we are separated today, but we might be able to all come back soon and be together again. Father, we thank you for your son who died on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It's me again. We had to juggle the schedule a little bit because of the pandemic and because some folks got sick. And so here we are again on video, and we're very thankful that you are tuning in this morning. And for those of you who don't know, my name's Nick Gill, and I'm not one of the ministers here, but I am excited to get to talk to you this morning. So let's get into this morning's lesson. One of the biggest hit singles of the 1990s was a song by Joan Osborne called One of Us. The song earned seven Grammy Award nominations. It's a song of spiritual questioning and about conceiving of God in a modern or a postmodern age. And the chorus says, what if God was one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to make his way home? And it was reported that when the song first began playing, radio stations were just inundated with calls from listeners who were enamored by the idea that God would become one of us, that God would actually show up on our planet dressed in the frail clothing of our humanity. They were in love with this idea that love came down, that love came near. And the full words of that song may well be irreverent, and certainly the lyrics lack theological precision, but they do capture in a secular hit the heart of the gospel story. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, we find an explanation, a depiction of God becoming a man. And theologians call it the incarnation. So let's celebrate this morning how love came down, became flesh, and dwelt among us by looking at some observations from John chapter 1 and remember being reminded of how these truths can reshape our lives. Turn to John chapter 1 with me, beginning with the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So the first observation we can make from this passage is that the Word is God. To the Jewish mind, a Word was far more than just a sound. A Word was something that had an active and almost independent existence, which actually went out from its speaker to do things. It was 
fearfully alive and as real and deadly as a bullet. In the Old Testament, the word of God appears as a carrier or an agent of God's spirit, a means by which, as the prophet Isaiah wrote, new life from God's dimension, from God's sphere, comes to bring new creation within ours. Isaiah talks about that in chapter 40 and verse 8 and chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. Isaiah 55, 11 is so powerful. God says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You could say it as his word, you could see it as his word being sent out on a mission and then coming back when it had completed it and saying, mission accomplished. A word almost had a life, an identity of its own. The Old Testament scripture was primarily written in the Hebrew language. And yet the ordinary people of Jesus' day spoke a development of Hebrew and the surrounding areas called Aramaic. And when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic, the copies were called Targums. It's a funny word, Targum. But the translators of the Targums, they were obsessed with the transcendence of God. To them, God was very far above and very far apart from humanity and from the world. And as such, they didn't like to, to speak of God using human terms. So in the Targum, they would often translate the name of God as something like the Word of God. So, for instance, in Deuteronomy 9 and verse 3, Moses describes Yahweh, the Lord, as a consuming fire. But the Targums translate that as the Word of God is a consuming fire. And they did this to avoid attributing human thoughts and actions and feelings to God. And as such, the phrase, the word of God, by the first century became a common form of Jewish expression to talk about the living God himself. The word of God became synonymous with God himself. And John picks up on this understanding when he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When the biblically literate reader hears the phrase, in the beginning, our minds jump back all the way to Genesis 1-1, where in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. From the beginning of our universe... The very beginning of time, when the beginning began, the word already was. There is but one God. He is one in substance, but three in person, Father, Son, and Spirit. And in this passage, the Son is referred to as the word. And verse 2 tells us that the word was in the beginning with God. Literally, it could be translated, he was face to face with God. The Father has always been in divine, loving relationship with the Son and the Son with the Father and with the Spirit. So, the first thing that that means to us is that Jesus is God and deserves our worship. In the 20th chapter of this Gospel, the Gospel of John, the Apostle Thomas finally realizes who Jesus is. And when he does, he declares, my Lord and my God. That's John 20, verse 28. Jesus isn't just a good man or a good teacher or a representative of God like the prophets were. The beginning of Deuteronomy chapter 6 is called the Shema, the Shema, and it captures the core belief of Jewish monotheism, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord our God is the only Lord. And everything else in their worship and ours comes from that central belief that there's one and only one true and living God. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 6, Paul puts Jesus right in the middle of that statement. It would be shocking to Jewish ears to listen, to hear 
Paul's letter read when the apostle says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Jesus is God and deserves our worship in everything we do. And the second observation we can make from this passage, this John 1, 1 through 18, is that the Word made all things. John 1, 3 says, All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Nothing was created except through Him. John's saying that the uncreated Word created all things. In Colossians 1, verse 16, Paul's writing about the preeminence of Christ, and he says, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And we can look at how the Trinity seems to work and get the idea that in some senses, the Father is the planner, and the Son is the doer, and the Spirit is the revealer. I know that's reductive, and any smarter theologians than me are cringing right now because that's not all. That doesn't encompass the relationship, but I think it captures a little bit of it. An example we can look at is in our redemption. The Father planned creations and especially humanity's redemption. The Son accomplished redemption, and the Holy Spirit has revealed that accomplishment and that opportunity to us. Here in creation, the Father planned creation. The Son actually created all things, and the Spirit reveals that to us. All of the Trinity was involved in creation, but the New Testament attributes the direct act of creation to the Son. And that's important when we're talking about the relationship between Jesus and us. In America here, we have patent laws and copyright laws so that, you know, whatever we create, we have the rights to. Jesus created us, and so Jesus has a right to our life. We can't really say, I'm going to live life however I want to. Well, we can. Jesus will let us, but we're missing out on everything Jesus has on offer when we decide that we're going to operate that way. Our life is not our own. We were created and redeemed by Jesus Christ, and he has absolute right to my life, to your life, to our lives. And as such, our response should be to lay down all our rights. We should say, Jesus, have your way in my life. I'm here to do your will. Lord, you are my creator and my owner. I submit my hopes, dreams, plans, time, talents, possessions, and my very will to you. I will to do your will. Have your way with my life. That's the kind of partnership that we're invited into where the creator of the universe offers to let us participate with him in his work if we will submit to him as our Lord, as our King. So, so far, we've seen that, that the word made all things. Jesus created you and has the right to your life. So live your life for his purpose and his glory. And the last observation we're going to try and make from this passage for uh, John 1, 1 through 18 this morning is that the Word is Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. 
For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. We won't have time this morning to go through as thorough an explanation, a discussion of these verses as I'd like, because these are some of my absolute favorite verses in the entire Bible. But it is important that we get a grasp of what they're saying. We're told that when Jesus came, he came to show us what God is like. The word, the message from God is Jesus. Moses gave the law. And, and it helped God, man to see the character of God, but there's no way that the full grace and truth of God could be revealed through the law. And no one had ever seen God, not in his fullness. Man was afraid of God. The, all the, so many of the stories in the Old Testament are describing God's struggle to get man to be able to survive his presence. God was so distant, so awesome, that man couldn't really comprehend him. And as such, God took on humanity to show us what he is like. And this, this word that is Jesus, is God's ultimate self-expression. In Jesus, the invisible, all-powerful, distant God became touchable. The awesome glory of God became resident in a person. This wasn't God wearing a disguise. In the beginning, God establishes the Garden of Eden as his temple in the midst of creation and places his image, humanity, in his temple, just like any other, any ancient Near Eastern God would do. Later, when Israel wanders in the desert, Yahweh commands the weaving of a tent a tabernacle in which his glory can dwell right in the midst of his people. But Israel would always be terrified of the glory of God lashing out at them. If you look at the words at the end of the book of Exodus and the words at the end of the book of Leviticus, you see that the, temp, the tabernacle itself created a challenge. It created a challenge for the children of Israel. Exodus 40, 35 says, Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting, the purpose of the tent was to meet for God to meet Israel. But Moses was unable to enter it because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Then Leviticus 1, 1 says, pretty much the next verse, it's three or four verses later. The Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Moses, and therefore Israel, God's people, cannot be in the presence of God. His holiness is too powerful for them. The story of the book of Leviticus is the story of God making a way for Israel to withstand his holiness. God's holiness is like the sun. The closer we get to the sun, no matter how life-giving and powerful and essential a presence it is for our lives here, if we get too close to the sun, we're going to be destroyed. And likewise, God's holiness is life-giving and powerful and essential, but it's also dangerous if you're unprepared. And the story of Leviticus is the story of God making a way for Israel to be prepared to experience his presence. Notice Numbers 1, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai. The problem has been solved in a sense, but look at that. It's still only two people, Moses or the high priest, that can come into God's presence. That's nothing like God's dream of full fellowship with all humanity. And just so, John isn't placing law in opposition or confrontation against grace and truth. That's a, that's a Reformation idea that gets read back into the Scriptures. It's not a biblical one. John's saying that what the law tried to do but couldn't overcome the flesh, grace 
and truth in Christ accomplished. The law came through Moses, and that was itself grace from God. But how much more grace and truth came through Jesus? John says that the word became flesh and tabernacled. That's the literal translation of the word dwelt. Tabernacled among us. He took on our humanity. He suffered hunger, pain, weariness, rejection, and everything that's part of being human. God has become one of us. Grace and truth is now embodied in a person. If humanity wants to see what God is like, he only needs, we only need to look at Jesus. And if we do, we'll find that God is not a tight-fisted, mean, nose-to-the-grindstone killjoy. Rather, the God we meet in Jesus is loving and compassionate and merciful and generous, angry at sin and absolutely head over heels in love with mankind, with humanity. That's the God we meet in Genesis 1 through 3, in Genesis 6, in Genesis 15, in Exodus 34, in Isaiah 53, and so many other places. That's who God is. So much so that he healed and delivered and taught and even sacrificed his own life for the human beings he had created. Soren Kierkegaard, the great Danish theologian of the 18th century, told the story of a prince who was running an errand for his father one day in a local village. And as he did so, he passed through a very poor section of town. And looking through the window of his carriage, he saw a beautiful young peasant girl walking along the street, and he could not get her off his mind. He continued to come to the town day after day just to see her and to feel as though he was near her. His heart yearned for her, but there was a problem. How could he develop a relationship with her? He could order her to marry him. It was in his power to do so. But he wanted this girl to love him from the heart, willingly. He could put on his royal garments and impress her with, you know, his entourage. He could roll up with her, to her front door with soldiers and a carriage drawn by a, team, a big team of horses. But if he did this... He would never be sure whether the girl loved him or was simply overwhelmed with his power and his position and his wealth. And so the prince, according to Kierkegaard's story, came up with another solution. And as you may have guessed, the prince gave up his kingly robe and symbols of power and privilege. And he moved into the village dressed only as a peasant. He lived among the people and shared their interests and concerns and talked their language. And in time, the young peasant girl grew to know him and then to love him. And that's what Jesus has done for us. The word became flesh. The king of heaven put aside his heavenly robes and his divine prerogatives. And he came to us as one of us, he lived among us, ate with us, drank with us, suffered with us, all to win our love. He could have forced us. He could have overwhelmed us. But he chose to woo us. And that's important. Jesus is God. And as such, he shows you what God is like. God is like Jesus. That's the most important truth of the incarnation. Not that Jesus is like God, but that God, the one we don't know, the one we're scared to know. God is like Jesus. And that God is in love with you. In love with humanity. Don't confuse God with mean, ruthless, stingy, and cruel, pseudo-religious people. God isn't at all like that. God is the one we see in Jesus. He's someone who has time for little children and grieving widows. He's the one not afraid to touch a leper, the uncleanest of the unclean in his world. Think for a moment. Who in our culture is the uncleanest of the unclean? 
the least acceptable, the one who, if they walked into this auditorium on a regular Sunday morning, the gasps of shock would be deafening. Today, you could say that our God is the kind of God who's not afraid to touch that person, to embrace that person. So, what all have we learned from John 1 this morning? We've learned that Jesus is God and deserves our worship. So, let's worship him. Second, he created us and has a right to our lives, so let's give our lives to him. He makes our life worth living, so we need to get our focus off of ourselves and realize that our lives really are meant to be about God, about the glorious work through us that he's willing to accomplish in our world. He provides light in our darkness, so we need to follow that light. He offers us eternal life, but we must receive him to have it. And finally, Jesus reveals to us who God really is. He loves and wants to help hurting, broken, and lost people. He's someone willing to lay down his life for yours. That is what we mean as Christians when we say the word God. The God you always wanted to believe in. He has been revealed in Jesus. Dare to believe it. Dare to experience him through Christ. Now that we know, let's develop a vital, essential relationship with him. A relationship that should shape every day of our lives. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are profoundly thankful that you came in the flesh through your son, Jesus, to redeem us to yourself. Today, we acknowledge the deity of Christ. We glorify him in our lives. We recognize that he is our creator and we submit our lives to him. Thank you for giving us him letting him come, sending him to bring us abundant life, to bring his glorious light into our dark world. We know that the only way we can enter into that life is by receiving him as our Lord and Savior and being immersed in him and raised up with our sins washed away. But we've seen that you are the best God we could imagine, more better than we can imagine, and we really want to come to know you. You've demonstrated that through your son. We pray for those this morning who've never pledged their allegiance to Christ. We pray for those who are away from him right now. We pray for those who are suffering illness. We pray for those who are worshiping in the spirit and crave the opportunity to be together again face to face. We pray that your spirit will show us all how much you love us and how you long to have an eternal relationship with us. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. As we think about what we're about to participate in, taking the, the elements of a communion in the Lord's Supper, it's also worth noting that we're thinking of Christmas coming up and while the world's focused on, on Jesus and on how he is Lord and how he came in the flesh and dwelt among men, it's also worth noting why he came. In Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5, Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God 
a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He came to live on this earth to live the perfect life, to become the perfect spotless lamb, to die on the cross so that God's plan of redemption would be enacted, so that we could be reunited with him one day because of the power of his blood. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your love. We're thankful that you loved us so much that you were willing to give up your one and only son so that we could be reunited with you, so that we could have forgiveness of our sins, so that we could live forever with you. Thank you for forgiving us, and thank you for loving us. And it's through your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Now let's pray for the cup. As we continue thinking about your, your sacrifice and your son's sacrifice, we're mindful of the power of your son's blood. The blood that was shed on the cross that forgives the sins of all mankind for all of time. The perfect spotless lamb. Help us to rejoice in that each and every day, but help us to also live mindful of that fact, mindful of your love and of what you sacrificed and help us to also sacrifice our lives, to be living sacrifices, to live for you each and every day. And it's through your son's name that we pray. Amen. Normally, this would be when we take up an offering and you have an opportunity to give. But obviously, because of the current circumstances and because we are virtual, uh, we're asking you to, you can still do that. And if, if you would like, you can mail in a check. You could utilize our online giving. And the link should be below somewhere, like right here, maybe. We'll see if I can do that. And uh, if not, it'll be uh, posted also at the end of this worship video. Uh, we also encourage you to, to look at your announcements, uh, look at your emails, check the Facebook page uh, for, for more um, upcoming news, and also keep the Montus in your prayers as they are um, needing that right now. And uh, we hope to see you soon, uh, Lord willing. And uh, now it's time for our, our closing prayer. Would you please bow with me for a word of closing prayer? Magnificent Heavenly Father, we come this morning thanking you for this opportunity to be together virtually, if not in person. We thank you, Lord, for the technology that enables us to do this. We thank you, Lord, for all things. We realize that we live in an imperfect society, but we serve a perfect God. And we give thanks for a perfect Savior. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that you have done for us. Our prayers go up this morning for those who are suffering with various illnesses, who are encumbered in so many ways, especially during this season when uh, an emphasis is placed on cheerfulness. It's very difficult to be cheerful, but dear Lord, let us have the peace in our hearts that will lead us to that joy that Paul talks about that surpasses all understanding. 
We ask you to be with us throughout the week, dear Lord. We ask you to bring us back together uh, at the next appropriate time. We ask you, Lord, to watch over us in all things. We offer up our prayer in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.